what a movie. <laughs> Thanks for sitting through that, guys. Um, I've just decided this is my new favorite Christmas film. <laughs> it's good for that kind of series. Um, it's so wild because I actually have never seen this on a big screen and in an audience like this, and it has such a different effect. Um, it's so intense. I I love the the group of films that you programmed. Um, you know, it's kind of like that subtle thread of horror. And to me, this is actually the most horrific film in the series in a way. You know, it's not technical horror, but it's it's intense. And George C. Scott is the daddy we all need. <laughs> um, or the dad we had, you know, like, or, I don't know. <laughs> kind of a... Kind of both, right? Because yeah. it's, it's so interesting, the, the duality of man that Schrader is exploring here and how sex informs us or lack of sex in religion, definitely. And I mean, it's just, it's such complex subject matter. So I love, I feel like this is actually what drew me to you and your love of this film and Paul Schrader. So do you want to talk about like your experience with this film and, and why you're moved by it? Yeah. So I think what I found so fascinating about this film is that in a lot of ways, the George C. Scott character is the pilgrim and he's supposed to be the most puritanical but he's actually the most violent. And he there's so much violence and that juxtaposition is so interesting because the arc of the pornography starts with just porn, X stuff, strippers, whatever, and then it goes into the snuff film territory. And I think the two are both symbolic that like, you know, the sex industry is this strange, completely natural, necessary part of humanity, but the snuff film in some ways is the the ultimate like destruction of that just as the ultimate destruction of religion is violence so it's like everything kind of degrades into violence even if it's pure even if it's not and i found that to be really fascinating and when i first watched this film it was with a boyfriend at the time and i was like oh i can't wait for you to see this movie and he saw it and he looked at me he's like i know why you like this movie it's because it's about like a skinny girl who's like dad, you know, like didn't know how to tell her she's beautiful. And like, I was like, oh my God. I was like, bro, I was like, bro, like the main character in my mind is Nikki. Yeah. Like Nikki is the real character because in a lot of ways he just abandons her and he has, it's like, he's like, should I give you money? Like, I don't know what to do with you because she is so in that purgatory where she's, she's both worlds, you know, like she's the Venus goddess of love you know, sex worker, which is, is like kind of the Mary Magdalene. It's like, you can't really quantify, you know, when sin and, and, and spirituality, you know, coincide. And I, that's what I think Paul Schrader is really trying to reconcile is like the fact that sin and spirituality do coincide and violence and sex do coincide, yet they are also, you know, opposed to each other. Well, that's what I find so interesting about this film because, you know, Schrader was actually in seminary school. He was training to become a priest. And then he became obsessed with cinema. He was a film critic. This movie feels so deeply um, autobiographical to me in a way. Like, I think it's like him most honoring like himself and his background and what he came from. And, you know, I think there's a real issue with like sex and religion and people suppressing. But sex also is creation. It's like creative life force and energy. And so it's so interesting how he kind of like explores the the dualities and dynamics of that. And um, something I think is really fascinating about him is like it's not in this movie, but it's in a lot of his films, like the journaling, the way that he creates, like the way that people mark time and move forward. And um, I'm wondering, like, in your own practice, do you have like a creative ritual? Is there a way that you access your creativity and, and what's that like for you? Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely journal and I write a lot and, and I do, um, unfortunately it's now more on my phone because I feel like now if you like sit down and bust out a journal, everybody's like, <laughs> it's like so out of the ordinary. So I just write now on my phone and do voice memos and stuff. But yeah, I just, any thought that comes to mind, I, I tend to put down immediately especially when it's one of those thoughts that's like what we're talking about, that's like a dance of the opposites, that's something that kind of plays on the absurdity and the irony of, um, yeah, the duality of, of good and evil, which is, you know, 
probably what Schrader is so obsessed about. Because when you're raised really religious, you those dualities become really intensified because you're told that this is good and this is bad, when in reality everything is like a little microcosm of that within itself. You know, It's not as easily explained away. It's not as black and white. And when you live in that, you kind of come out seeing more clearly how that th that's like not actually the way the world is. It's not that diabolical. Um, so I think, yeah, whenever I have, uh, you know, lyrics or anything like that, it's usually trying to capture that moment that's like the in-between, you know, where the snake bites its tail, you know, the beginning and the end. Like, you could say it a million different ways, but you guys know what I'm talking about, so. <laughs> and in terms of like your own work, I feel like cinema like weaves through your music your musicality the lyrics the the music videos that you're making it's there's such a deep um i feel like connection and correlation so do you want to talk about like your connection to cinema and like maybe what were some of the first moments i remember you told me a story that didn't make it into the interview we did about the video store and dr strange love so i don't know if you want to share some of that yeah i i grew up when you could rent videos and I would go to Hollywood Video and I'd go straight to the cult section and I'd just mine all the weirdest stuff. And I think I saw Pink Flamingos when I was like 12 or 13 mm -hmm. in the basement. My mom was at the top of the stairs. What are you watching? And I was like, uh, just just a movie, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing special. Just like, whoa, this movie's insane. Um, but when I was really little, um, I went to a video store and I heard there was a movie called Dr. Strangelove. And I'm like, that must be the craziest, most psychedelic movie of all time. <laughs> And I was having, I was like literally six or seven years old. I was having a sleepover with a bunch of little girls. And the dad was like, so what movies do you guys want to get? I was like, we should get Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and they were all like, okay. And we watched it. And it was just like so black and white and just way over my head and so boring. And me and the little <laughs> girls were like, they were like asleep. And I was like trying to watch it. I was like, this movie sucks. And the dad was just laughing because he's like, you have no idea what this movie is. And I was, I was just like uh, trying to be... Um, trying to get into it but it was like way over my head but I kind of just knew I was like that must be a really big deal movie and now in hindsight it is but as a child it made very little sense until he rode the bomb and I was like okay and I woke up my friends I was like look see it's like a good movie see he's, he's riding a nuclear bomb I love that um and you know it's interesting to even watch like the progression of your music videos because like we were talking about it, we're, we're similar in age and I feel like we did grow up in that generation where movies were playing constantly on TV. We did have the access to Blockbuster and Hollywood Video in your case and it was like this special moment going to like take in what you were going to take in and explore what you were going to explore. You almost had to work really hard to find interesting things. Like now I find everything like to be so accessible. But what I think is really interesting is like the stuff that's running through the subconscious, like I feel like there was a lot of horror on loop. And so it's interesting to me, you're drawn to horror and like it's in, you know, that first video that we watched and like American Werewolf in London, like where comedy like meets horror and then like, and then it graduated almost to like this like Gene Kelly musical style and it's like all over. So do you want to tell me like how you connect that and how you feel about the way like art kind of just like merges into to who we are? Definitely. Um, I feel like in the case of horror films, I was just really into experimental music, experimental electronic music and noise music. And the only outlet for anything remotely like that in the mainstream is through horror movie soundtracks. Um, and so it was like, I, I actually was really into the soundtracks. And I remember some of my first music, if I'd ever play it for any member of my family, they'd be like, sounds like a horror film. Like that was all like anybody really knew how to explain what I was doing. And I was like, yeah, it does. Yeah, that's right. And um, and I think because it was so forbidden, it was like the ultimate forbidden fruit, like horror movies. So as a little kid, if I'd go to a friend's house, that would be the first thing I would try to do is like, let's, can we, you got any rated R movies? Like, so I think the macabre became a fascination for me, but really just in the context, not like I wanted to be terrified, but I just felt like they, it was such a good document um, in terms of like interesting techniques of sound and in the case of Friday the 13th and Halloween that first kind of POV filmmaking where it's like this very jerky you know kind of handheld camera of the um, the stalker kind of and I felt like that was like high art but it was a total accident because it's in the context of B movies and I think I really like that juxtaposition as well when something incredibly 
innovative and artistic happens, but not for intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like why I like horror because it transcends both those things. Um, it's, it's for the people yet it can also be a strange high art. And now I feel like it's morphed into a genre where people just comment on society. It's become our societal like commentary uh, medium of communication through, through horror and like combining elements of comedy and horror. And I think that's because, yeah, the 20th century really is like the age of the spectacle. And so, you know, things that are like simultaneously horrific and funny make sense to a modern person in a, in a very weird way that um that it just resonates because I think we we do kind of live in a nightmare totally. in a lot of ways <laughs> but it's also quite absurd and and I think how most people cope with it is is through like memification and, and laughter um and then I think as far we were talking about horror now Gene Kelly yeah okay well the MGM musicals are just like um the best um they're so pointless the plots are awful like most of it is quite bad, but they just they they created a spectacle like a fantasy realm that is so complete. And especially at like really early ones, like if you watch That's Entertainment and you watch scenes of like the first singing in the rain in the 1920s, I mean they were building sets that will never be built again with like you know hundreds of people on like a cake tower that's spinning and the camera, you know, like that was a time in film that was so um, practical effects to the max and just like it's kind of like a, a spectacle we'll never create again. Mm -hmm. So I think that it has like, it's really, it has a really special place in film history. And it also can be used as a medium of communication in terms of like representing humanity in the most fantastical way. And I kind of felt like, you know, a technicolor apocalypse kind of makes sense in terms of like how it feels to be inundated with so much abstract uncertainty about the future yet also be completely inundated with entertainment all at once, you know, with our phones and, and with, you know, the steady stream of movies and TV and, and everything. So it just felt like a, an apocalypse technicolor nightmare with a song and dance man cell phone that eats people. Like, I don't know, it just felt appropriate, but so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's actually, like, a really interesting way to look at film, like, kind of, like, processing, like, the nightmare that is modern society and, like, and just this way that's so different. We're so disconnected from nature and, like, this thing that we used to be, but it's, like, also beautiful and amazing to be a part of and to witness it. And something that I love that you said was how cinema is kind of almost like manufactured dreams. It's like this like fourth dimension dream world. And that's also something that Paul Schrader really believes in. Like he's all about touching the fourth dimension and that which is not seen that is all around us. And I think that's maybe the connection to his spirituality and all these things. But even just in noticing the threading of this programming for this weekend, like subtle things like catching the Mickey Mouse that is in American Werewolf in London for like a second. And then it's the Mickey Mouse sheets as she lays it down on the bed in the brothel. And I just love the way like things are always connected all around us, you know, so. Definitely, Mickey is everywhere. <laughs> He's been around a long time. Um, and yeah, no, I, I do think that uh, it, it's um, it's it, it's important to acknowledge that, that movies are kind of like the closest thing we have to representing our dreams um, for each other. And I think that, you know, I, I do want to preface saying like, yeah, it's a nightmare now. It might've always been a nightmare. Like yes. maybe that is the human condition is that like, it is a nightmare also, um, and a beautiful dream all at once. So just wanted to say that I don't want to seem like I'm super down on modernity. I'm trying to get into it, you know, like <laughs> it's all good. It's all the things. Um, I'd love to open it up to audience questions. I I do think that uh, we live in a time of kind of false connectivity. Like I think our phone gives us the sense of connectivity, but I do think that it actually encourages transactional relationships. And I think that that doesn't actually foster like really strong, deep connections. I think that we are losing connectivity because of this artifice of connectivity. And I think that it doesn't leave a lot of space for people to get really close to each other when there's constantly this idea that something better is next or that you just have to keep hustling yourself to be a better version of yourself. You know, I think all these things are very distracting and, and 
isolating. And I think especially in America, the way our culture is structured, we don't really um, pay a lot of attention to lifestyle and hanging out versus I think other cultures and other places in the world, they actually still make a priority of being around each other a lot every day, seeing people. And I think in America, especially, there's such a hustle mentality. There's such a, you know, um, an aspirationalism or like an American dream idea that I think that it, the lifestyle certainly suffers and people are incredibly isolated here. So I do think we're having trouble connecting. And I think it's because we're so falsely connected. I think it's distracting. Tim Burton. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Danny Elfman's got that. Um, that's a good question. Oh, boy. Um, well, I mean, I'm like, I'm a Martin Scorsese. I mean, I would like to sing in one of his movies if he ever needs like a sassy jazz lady or something. <laughs> I've thought about it because um, I'm a big fan of The Man I Love, which is kind of what um, he's really inspired by. And um, I, I, I have so many directors that I love. That's actually a really, really tough uh, thing to answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, just heavyweights. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of one more. I don't know, James Cameron. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be pretty lit, I think. Yeah. No, I think the real the real tragedy of the film is that he doesn't see Nikki as his like symbolic daughter and that she is like symbolically fatherless and just goes back to her life, you know, and I, I think she just goes back to being a sex worker. Um, and, you know, I, I think we live in a day and age where sex positive is, positivism is really important. So I don't want to, you know, say anything negative about Nikki, but I do think that in some ways she, it is kind of sad that she doesn't get the redemption and that she has to stay in, in that, that purgatory, um, because it is kind of a purgatory, you know, it's like, I want to be positive about sex work, but I also know a lot of sex workers and it's, it's not, um, always, you know, fabulous. It can be, it can be rife with a lot of dangerous things. It's, um, it's definitely a very complicated subject matter. So it's difficult for me to talk more about Nikki without diving into that. And I just, it's a long conversation. What happens to Nikki? I think, you know, like, but we hope that she, uh, she goes to the church of Vesuvius or whatever, and maybe she pops out some hippie kids, you know, who knows, you know, or she gets into like writing scripts and makes a bunch of cheddar with all her stories, you know, that's the best outcome. <laughs> totally. I, my parents were really into music. So there was like a piano in our house. There were guitars lying around and my dad would play guitar all the time. He was like the worship leader at our church. So we would sing for church and, you know, kumbaya, my lord, like all that stuff. Um, and so I was just very musical from a very young age. But, like, I used to listen to the radio. And this is another thing I feel really lucky about, like, being the age that I am. I remember when Nirvana was on the radio and in the early 90s. Where there, there was really a lot of great alternative music. And I would just tape record songs that I heard off the radio and try to figure out what they were and... And I was just so obsessed with um, with the format. You know, I would just listen to like Jagged Little Pill and just be kind of like, oh my gosh, like what does that chord change mean? I'd ask my parents like, what does that chord change? And my dad would be like, oh, that's like some dissonance. You know, it's kind of like, I'm like, it's giving me angst, you know, like. So I, I just, I think I have whatever that sense is where it's like, if people can see color, it's like I can like feel the emotions of uh, sound and uh, whatever part of the brain that is must have been really big with me because it just, it happened pretty uh, instantaneously as a kid. So. Amazing. Well, we have another screening to get to, we Funeral do. Parade of Roses. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. It's been so special. So thank you. Thank you guys for coming out.